thank you for uh, turning up for session five of the Agile Brown Bragg series. Uh, my name is Gareth Holbrook. We've been doing this for the last uh, few days this week and a few weeks ago. And the purpose was, uh, going back to mid-November, I attended a sprint review and retrospective. And I thought, well, people are struggling here because uh, it, it, it seemed to be very ad hoc and not codified and, and not structured how the, the events were being run. And I understand that the way we at SoftEd deliver the training course, we focus very much on the values and principles and the mindset of Agile. And we try and avoid giving out the cookbook of how to do Agile, um, which is very valid and I, I do support that approach. Having said that, when you go to an organization and, and they're struggling to run the practices, there is merit in um, providing some guidance. So that's, that's why I'm doing these brown bag ser series. Um, we had quite a good turnout yesterday. There's quite a few, few of you here today as well. Thank you for turning up. And for everyone else online, we have a ability for you to ask questions. So anyone in the room, you can ask questions whenever you like. Just put your hand up. And online, just Skype John Connolly, and he's got the microphone, and he will uh, ask me the question, and I can respond back. If you happen to be in this wonderful building in Canberra, feel free to come down to NIBS. It's so much more fun if we have face-to-face uh, -face contact. So, slide one, the Agile Manifesto. You know what, that slide one should be slide three. <laughs> I'll go to this slide next. The Agile Brown Bag Series. So, the first one we did was we talked about the how and why of Agile. I talked about a bit of the history, the values and principles of Agile, and why it may work and, and be useful for any kind of work, not just in IT, uh, but where we've got complex knowledge, conceptual kind of work. The second session I did was on user stories, how to break down user requirements and articulate them in a way that makes it easy for everybody to understand what the outcome is and why we're trying to do it. Yesterday, oh sorry, Monday this week, we talked about agile planning, so sprint planning, st daily stand-up, the uh, release planning, and the sp uh, within the sprint, uh, running backlog refinement. And the message there is that within Agile, we are continually planning. It's not a single event at the beginning. We understand that as the world changes, we need to change our course. So we're continually tweaking and adjusting the plan. Then yesterday, I went through the sprint review, or the showcase as you call it here, gave you an example of, a, of an agenda, and some tips and tricks that I use as a scrum master when I'm coaching a team. So these first four, uh, uh, presentations I've done have been recorded so they're online somewhere and we can and you can pick them up and the PowerPoints are available too for your future reference. Today we're going to be talking about retrospectives and then tomorrow visual management and if we can find a slot I would like to talk about lean principles on Friday and play a game with coins. So we, uh, we can do it with 10 people so there might be enough people here today but uh, Definitely, if we have 20 people, we can make a real good fun game of it where we learn how to flip coins and we learn the benefits of flow and minimizing work in progress. So, the Agile Manifesto, to reiterate, these are the four values of the Agile Manifesto. And today, we're just going to focus on this top one. It's the first for a reason. It's individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Remember, it doesn't mean that we completely avoid or disregard processes and tools, we still need them, but that we favour the people, we favour the individuals and interactions, that face-to-face -face communication and creating an environment which lends itself to joyful work. Doing and being, I've covered that slightly already today. So um, I've been in a few meetings this week uh, and I asked the question, how's it going? How are you finding Agile? And the answer quite often is, yes, we're doing Agile quite well. We use Jira, we have whiteboards, we use post-it notes, we have stories. And yes, you're d doing Agile, you're following the practice. But being Agile is a mindset, and I, I cannot emphasize this enough. It's a way of thinking. It's the way you approach problems in the world. And then when you have an Agile mindset, a growth mindset, and an acceptance that you can't know everything up front, and that you're going to learn on the way, then the practices that you follow become less relevant, in fact. Um, but there are practices in Agile, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So being Agile starts a virtuous cycle of joy and work, customer delight, 
It will set your organisation on a journey of cultural transformation, creating an environment of creativity, productivity and increased profitability. And I guess in the case of ABS, it's the positive social outcomes that you can serve the Australian people with. So, beneath the four values of Agile, uh, the Agile Manifesto are 12 principles and today we're particularly interested in number 12, which is my favourite as a Scrum Master. At regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective, then tunes and adjusts its behaviour accordingly. So what we're saying here is the team are continually trying to improve the way they work, the way they respond to the environment and the organisation, and the way they address particular challenges that they're faced with. Here's an, a whole load of practices. So on the left, uh, some of them we've covered already, the stand-up, user stories, relative sizing, release planning. And at the bottom, the second to bottom line, you can see retrospectives. Um, on the right is technical practices, and there are many. Th these are just a few examples. If you're in a non-technical agile team, you will have your own technical practices, which are specific to the way you're working. Kaizen, Japanese for good change. Uh, I brought this in because I've talked about continual improvement already. And uh, this was first used or coined in industry by Toyota and in manufacturing and in industry it's used quite regularly now that the process, the production process is continually improved. They have regular opportunities to look at how they can fix things and they don't try and fix everything at once. It's a little and often what small thing can we do today to make ourselves go a little bit better tomorrow and it's used not only in Toyota um, and Japanese companies, but now in the West, most companies adopt continual improvement. I've heard people call it continuous improvement. There is a distinct difference. Continuous is that you don't stop uh, um, and is continually changing. Continual implies that you go for a period of time, you stop, you review where you're at, you see what you can improve, and then you go again. One great book to consider in Kaizen is called The Spirit of Kaizen. And it talks about Kaizen not just in industry and in business, but also in your personal life, how you can continually improve. So, the retrospective. One of the challenges we have with retrospectives is if people have had a difficult iteration, if they've had a difficult sprint, you may go into the retrospective feeling guarded, feeling insecure, feeling... Um, that everyone's going to blame you because it was your fault that the sprint failed. This could happen, and in some terms I've seen it happen. And one of the main assumptions I have, and it's, it's the backbone of everything that I do as an Agilist, is that everybody comes to work to do a great job. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I want to do a shocking, shoddy job today. People want to do the best. The challenge is sometimes their performance indicators, their KPIs, are at odds with what is possible for them and also the environment doesn't help them. So people feel threatened and then their behaviour responds as any animal would behave if, if you feel threatened, you either fight or flight. So what we need to do is change this. Firstly, using Kaizen, we want to change the environment around the team. But we also want to make the team feel safe because that's the way we can openly address challenges, be honest and courageous with each other and trust each other. So there are many techniques for this. Um, one technique is to read this, the retrospective prime directive, before um, any retrospective starts. Uh, regardless of what we discover, we understand and truly believe that everyone did the best job they could, given what they knew at the time, their skills and abilities, and the resources available, and the situation at hand. So I call this out, um, and when I kick off a retrospective, I make it patently clear that anything we say in the room stays in the room. It's perfectly safe. And what we're trying to do, the purpose of the ret retrospective, is to make our own lives easier so that we can perform better. And we all agree that we want to do that. So I always make this as an explicit statement at the beginning. Bake a cake. I had one team once, and we, it was in, I was relatively new to Agile, and we uh, had a great uh, bunch of people. And in one retrospective, uh, one of the developers came along, and she'd baked a cake and it didn't look quite like that. It was good, it was tasty, and she said, why don't we, uh, as part of our retrospective, we agreed, why don't we take it in turns to bake a cake every uh, iteration, every uh, retrospective? 
And that's what we did, and it, it was quite good fun. Um, strangely, another team, uh, a few months later, I was in the, in the same organisation, another team, uh, in their retrospective, somebody wrote on a post-it note, cake. Ah, okay, I've heard this before. So we put it on the board, and I said, right, so who, who uh, mentioned cake? And it was another guy, and he said, yeah, got a problem. Um, we've got three teams sat all together, and a table in the middle next to my desk, and it seems every day somebody's bringing a cake in. And I'm trying to lose weight. Can we, can we cut it down, please? So um, don't overdo it, but uh, baking a cake is rewarding for yourself. It's good fun for the team, and it's a good bonding, um, building of trust technique. And it then sets the tone for the retrospective that it should be good fun. You may have a retrospective in a meeting room in the office. Um, many times I take people out to the coffee shop, and we do it there. Obviously, in a noisy coffee shop with a grinder going and everything, you can't have the deep conversations. But sometimes it's good just to get out of the office and be together and, and connect uh, because it's the interactions and the way we work together which is more important than the specific actions we're going to take. So um, here are a whole bundle of retrospective techniques and I'll explain how they're set up, um, how, how they're structured. Um, if you look in the top right hand corner you can see that figure of eight and it says there's a cycle here that you set the stage, you gather the data, you generate insights then you decide what to do, and then you close a retrospective. And it's that simple. That's pretty much the agenda. And within there, there's lots of techniques. I'm not going to cover all of them. I may talk about a few. Um, there's a great book called Agile Retrospectives by Esther Darby, and she explains this in more detail. Uh, Diana Larson and Esther Darby. And if you want uh, retrospective games, then um, there's a website called Tasty Cupcakes. Dot org. Not dot .com. You'll get into trouble going on to tastycupcakes.com. Dot .com. It's dot .org. And it has, it's, a, it's an open source where people just copy in games that they've developed. So there's always new, fresh ideas out there. And it's important to keep it fresh. Don't always follow the same format because it comes stale very, very quickly. So setting the stage. Check in. So every meeting I do, uh, we get everybody to speak once. Uh, it may just be, how do you feel today? Uh, are you an explorer, shopper, vacationer, pr prisoner? What mindset are you in? How did you feel the sprint went? Um, if it's on a Friday, what's he going to do this weekend? Something. And it doesn't need to be an extensive conversation. It just enables everybody to speak once because it breaks the ice. So that's the first thing. We may say focus on, focus off, which is um, to talk about what specifically do we want to cover today. So with maybe a particular area we want to cover in the retrospective. And especially with new teams, I may focus before we get going on some of the working agreements. So if people have iPhones on or, or the, they've got the laptops going, I'll ask them to switch them off uh, because that's really disruptive. I know some people like to take notes, but what I like is 100% engagement with eye contact and body language and face-to-face -face communication. And we don't need to take notes. So in most meetings, I actually try and encourage that. Uh, and the reason is, if you're 100% committed to the conversation, you'll get so much more richness. And then we find a way afterwards to take the notes and cover what we, we, we discussed. So that's setting the stage, that's setting us up. And then we get into this cycle. First, we want to gather the data, and we want to have as much divergent data as possible. So silent brainstorming, using post-it notes, finding out, making observations of what people saw. And we do this before we make any insights. So we try and gather the data with no judgments at all. Once we have the data, we then try and collect it together and see if there are patterns forming. Did everybody feel the same way? Did somebody feel differently? Did uh, a few people notice something which other people missed? Uh, what does this mean? Uh, what could this mean? Do we have a hypothesis? So we try and generate some in insights. And there's all of those techniques there, from five whites to fish bones. Um, I'm usually quite simple with the way I do that. And then it's up to the facilitator, the scrum master, to then go around and work out what can we do about it. So there's no point having a retrospective and saying, well, it's, it's not very good around here. You know, we don't have the environments, we've not got the support from the executives, blah, 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 blah. If it just becomes a complaint session, you're not going to get anything else of it. So it's really important that you have concrete actions of what you're going to do. And so I commit the team, I enable the team to commit to at least one thing that they're going to do differently next sprint. They may have 
10 or 15 actions, which is too many. So then I say, what are the five top things that we want to focus on this, this sprint? And those go on to the backlog for the next sprint, and we will talk about them in sprint planning, and we will capture them, um, and they'll be on the, on the scrum board. So um, you see there on the Generate Insights prioritize with dots. It's called dot voting. Um, so let's say I did have 15 action points. I would ask the team to have three votes and vote on the top three things that they want to work on. And then the top five things in, in numbers were the things that the team agreed to do. And then we would just go through again. We would close the retrospective off by uh, agreeing and confirming what we found out, how we felt, how the, the iteration went, and what we're going to do about it. In the closure of the retrospective, I run a retrospective of the retrospective. That's because everything we want to do, we want to inspect and adapt. And we want to, I would like to ask the team, what could we do better next time? What was it about this retrospective which was valuable, and what can we change? How can we have this as a better, more effective retrospective? So those are the retrospective techniques. And here is a typical agenda. So if you came into a retrospective of mine, you would see on the whiteboard an agenda looking something like that. So the introduction, I would introduce straight away on time. And I will talk uh, about the power start. I mentioned the power start yesterday, so I'll talk about the purpose, the outcome, what's in it for me, the engagements and roles. So it would sound something like this. The purpose of a retrospective is to review the work we've done in the last few weeks, the challenges we faced, try and build together to see if there's any patterns and what we can do to do dif things differently next time. The outcome should be a handful of actions that we as a team commit to that we're going to do differently next sprint. This should help you become uh, more effective in the way you work, have an easier um, environment to work in and resolve challenges together and you as a team form more cohesively. I'm here as your uh, Scrum Master. It's a workshop. It's for you to actively engage. And so I would then talk about the Prime Directive and explain that I'm here just as a facilitator. It can be a challenge, by the way, if you're a Scrum Master, to be contributing as well because what we need is a neutral arbiter, somebody who has no bias at all. And it can sometimes be difficult if you're the scrum master of the team because you'll want to contribute to some of the ideas. So um, for those who are going to be um, uh, facilitators out there, be, be conscious of that. So then I do the check-in, go around, ask the team how they feel uh, very quick. And then we go on to the last retrospective uh, commitments. I also do this in the sprint planning the following day for this retrospective. And usually what I'll do is I'll surprise the team, I'll say, hey guys, so what did we agree last time? And there's usually a wall of silence. And what I do is say, uh, okay, I've got my flip chart here. And in the flip chart, there'll be five or six things that we agreed in the last retrospective that we were going to do. Uh, and I say, so we, we agreed we were going to go to coffee together every Thursday. Did we do that? We also agreed that we would pair up uh, we agreed that the tester would talk to the developer before running the test scripts. And I would go through and ask, have we achieved that? If we have, great. If we haven't, should we continue to do it? And that would, so, so that would be a quick conversation, but we have to do this. Uh, one thing I could do, when I go to an organization and find out how they're doing with Agile, I ask about retrospectives. And in some cases, in many cases actually, they say, yeah, we used to do retros, but no, no use. No, nothing changes around here. We don't do anything differently and we sort of forgot to do them. I have to say I've heard that here as well. Um, and the thing is if you have a retrospective that is codified and structured and you have de deliberate Kaizen retrospective commitments that you follow up on, you will get that feedback. You will see the value in it and people will want to come along. Also if you do bring cake, people will definitely want to come along, which is one reason why I do it. Then I run the moodometer. I've got an example of the moodometer in another slide, so I'll show you that. And this is to find out how did people feel during the sprint. And we can, get, we can generate insights from this. We can gather data, and it's good fun, and it's a way for people to drop down the barriers. Each person talks about how they felt during the whole 10 days of the sprint, if it was a two-week sprint. And then from it, we can analyze some patterns and see if we can get insights from that. My most common way of then generating data, uh, gathering data, is what went well, what didn't go well. And this is silent brainstorming. It's using post-it notes. And for a few minutes, we get people to write down all of these things. I may have actually four quadrants. This is my favorite. So what went well, what didn't go well, any ideas, and thanks. So all of the things in the sprint that went well, 
all of the things that we can improve next time. Any particular ideas like, hey, why don't we bake a cake for each other? And finally, thanks. And what I do is, firstly, the went well, I pick up all of the uh, post-it notes, and I keep an eye on who wrote on the blue and who wrote on the red, and then I swap them around, and I get people to pair interview each other. So we go around the table, and the person who picks up the blue saying uh, the test environment wasn't ready, the person who wrote it says, yeah, well, I was trying to run the test, and this didn't work. So then they have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And as a facilitator, I stand back and allow them to continue the conversation and then just step in to say, so what can we do about this? What can we do differently? So it means the team are engaging. It's about the team collaborating against themselves. It's not about the scrum master running the team. Then we do what, what, went, well, that's what went well. Then what didn't go well, we do the same. Then any particular ideas, we go around the table again. And then this is uh, a fun thing I did. And I learned this from a scrum master in her very first retrospective. I don't know where she got it from. Thanks and to thank somebody else in the team for something they did in that sprint. But then what I do is I gather them all up and I hand them out again, appearing to look random. And then, uh, Pete, thanks for helping me. Oh, I'm a bit embarrassed now. So you actually give it to Pete. And you make sure that, it can be a bit awkward if everyone gets all of the thanks and no one else does. But what we try and do is distribute it around. And we do this is because we consciously acknowledge the work we do with each other. And it's part of that bonding and the forming of the teams. So that's how I, what I do with what went well and what didn't get, what go well. We've generated I, uh, the data, we've gathered the data, we've generated the insights. And through it, we progressively build the actions. And at the end, I do the retro two, the retrospective of the retrospective, and we wrap. Typically, for a two-week iteration, I would spend 90 minutes on a, in a retrospective. The Scrum Guide actually says for a one-month sprint, it's three hours, and usually shorter for shorter sprints. I'm aware here that many people do the showcase and retro in about half an hour, then knock out a sprint planning in another half hour. To, to follow Scrum properly, it, you have to have a really structured way of running the events, and the events take up 10% of your time. So the sprint planning is, for, for a two-week sprint, a sprint planning is four hours long, the review is two hours long and the retrospective 90 minutes long. So that's the whole day, either end of the sprint. And that sets up the sprint properly and closes it off properly and then using Kaizen continually improve. And here's an example of a moodometer. What can we see here? So what I, what I do is I put the X, Y axes up. You've got the 10 days of the sprint here. I've not got, quite got it here. I've got somebody cheering up there, somebody going meh there. And then that's the logo of New Zealand Post, uh, because they've gone postal. So, and so obviously, there's a sliding scale from really happy to really not happy. And then what each, each member does is they pick up a different color pen and they say, yeah, it started off really well, but then I had a problem, uh, wasn't too happy, then it ended at the end. And look at this here. I, I just picked through my library of photographs and I thought this looked cool. Obviously, something went really wrong with this person on that day because they went into a spiral down. <laughs> but, you know, there's a handful of things we can learn about this because, um, firstly, sometimes some people are really happy when other people are not. And I can say to the team, did you know that this person was feeling like this? And they go, no. And once I had one team member who was down here all the time, and I said, well, what went on? He said, well, I was on the BAU work. It was a non-technical team, and he was doing, fielding all of the BAU work. And he said, I was getting through it, but I just felt out of the loop because the team were doing all this cool stuff and I was doing BAU work. I didn't feel part of the team. And nobody knew this. It was completely, um, they were oblivious to it. So, what can we do about this? And somebody said, well, why don't we share that BAU work? We all own it as a team. Why, don't we, why are we leaving it just to one person? So, sure enough, in the next sprint, he was up a bit. The other passage I notice on these moodometers is people generally start off quite happy. They usually finish quite happy, even on a failed sprint. At least there's a relief of it's over, we can stop and have a look at what we're doing. And then there's that uh, valley of despair in the bit middle here. We all get it. And I ask the question, because obviously I'm pitching the, the virtues of Agile. I say, um, actually, I did a, a company in, in Auckland. Uh, I did a, one of these moodometers for 12 months because they wanted to see how the project had gone for 12 months. And they had this valley of despair, which was between um, December last year and March this year. Uh, and so, so what I say to people in these two experiences, 
Well, you know, if it's Thursday on the first week and you're feeling pretty ropey, you know next week we're going to be having cake and a retrospective, so it's going to end soon. It's the Stockman syndrome, that the, the Stockman paradox is that you, you know you're going to prevail. You've just got to be optimistic, but be realistic at the same time. And this is the benefit of doing small pieces of work, is because people tend to have regular occurrences where they feel good again, and even if there's times when people feel challenged, it's only for a short space of time, so it doesn't feel like it's Groundhog Day. So then we can generate other insights here. You may find particular incidents where the whole team swings together, forward and backwards. So the moodometer, I always prefer to do this, especially with new teams. For the first five or six sprints, we'll do this every sprint. And then we'll look at look, sprint number five. I'll take a picture of the first one and show it them, and we'll see the trends. It's obviously not scientific. It's very subjective. And of course, the first person who goes is going to influence what everybody else says. Um, but it's just a good, fun way to enable people to open those conversations. Here is uh, another team. Uh, and you can see there, I had celebration challenge. I sort of make it up on the fly. Uh, what we're going to celebrate from the sprint and what the, were the challenges we had in the sprint. And just out of interest, this was at Westpac. And we'd just done the um, cultural transformation. And within the cultural transformation, I'd, I'd facilitated this whole day with 50 people. And we had groups of how the culture at Westpac is going to change. And within these groups, we ended up with these four, six names, six words, ownership, uh, collaboration, alignment, growth, fun, and integrity. And what I did is when they had these challenges, when I handed them out, I just collected them together and said, ah, that sounds like an ownership problem. And before we knew it, we had all six. And then I said, surprise, this is the six um, areas of uh, focus that we want to look at with our culture. So that's something I, I just, uh, it just happened automatically. But from this, we've got the data. Then we can go through these challenges and say, with this one here, what is it that we could do differently? And I incessantly say, keep asking the team, what can we do differently? And if it's one or two things we do differently in the next sprint, brilliant. Uh, here's another retrospective. You can see the moodometer there. Uh, liked, loathed, learned. There's another one. Uh, sometimes, sometimes people don't like loathed. And um, you can see the actions we took away from that. Uh, Matt, uh, who wanted to become a scrum master, I said, great. Uh, what I want to see you do is um, explain on a whiteboard scrum in 10 minutes. And I think any scrum master should be able to do that. So that was Matt's little job there. Look at this here. Definition of done, definition of ready before sprint one. Yes, so I think in that sprint it was, I forgot which team that was, we probably, the, the definition of done was probably not ready. And you can see there, the introduction, last retrospective, moodometer, L3, like loath learned, actions, and wrap. And if we have anything which is too big for us to cover here, I would park, which we didn't have. And by the way, those are the minutes. I generally keep it within the team, but often I could print that out and put it on the scrum board so anybody can see it. Obviously, if there's something which is um, sensitive that we don't want the whole organization to see, we wouldn't do that. But the, we want the team to be as open book as possible and feel safe to say, hey, you know, we felt pretty shocking there. It's, it's open and it's honest. There's uh, another technique I did with one team. It was a silent mind map. So I just gave them all a whiteboard marker and said, draw me a mind map of how it went. And they spent 10 minutes on it, and then we just talked through the whole mind map. And this was a really high-performing team. They a great bunch of people. Uh, but you can see they're all actively engaged. I think the product owner was uh, sat out the back. It was a team of six. And they got great benefit from doing silent mind mapping. And that is everything I've got in retrospectives. Um, the, th the closing statements I would have on it is that it's fundamentally important to the way we run Agile teams. Agile is about people and inter individuals and interactions. And we want to create a safe environment so people feel that they can have control over their own destiny and improve the, work, the environment they work in. Is there any questions come through, John? Um, not through on Skype yet, but just um, one question from me. Um, I've read that there are sort of different approaches to how you should manage the improvements of the team. Um, yeah. Whether you run a, uh, I've heard that you know in some situations people run a separate Kanban board to track the uh, the team's. Yeah. Um, 
you know, the, the, the outcomes of the, the retrospective, what they want to do better. Um, and then there's another view that obviously it's, it's, it's that important that you should combine it into the, uh, uh, into the normal scrum board. It's another task that you must tackle next sprint kind of thing. Yeah. What's your sort of view on uh, the best way to sort of track those improvements? I, I'm aware of both. They have to be tracked and they have to be clear and especially at the, at the sprint planning the next day. What I'll normally have is still the whiteboard from the day before. So let's go back. We'll have this whiteboard up and we'll have these actions here and I'll, I'll stand in front, I know I'm not on camera now, but I'll stand in front and go, hey team, what did we agree to yesterday? And nobody will ever remember. But after a few sprints, they will learn that we need to have this consciously front and centre. So it will be on the scrum board. My personal preference is for the team to not create a user story per se, but maybe, um, I have swim lanes, so these are the stuff that we do which isn't part of like value to the customer user story and within the sprint backlog have an item so it could be uh, here's a good example uh, the whole team are really confused with the way the database architecture works and only one person knows and that's a really big issue so I would say hey guys what can we do about that and hopefully the database guy will say you know what I'll give you a two hour brown bag and I'll explain it bingo because then we'll share the information and then that would be a ticket and then when we pull it into the next sprint, we would organize ourselves that we would have that brown bag within the sprint. And then at the next sprint retrospective, I would say, what did we agree? And we said, the database brown bag. Did we do it? Bingo. I do know people who actually capture them. They're a lot better at administration than me. They capture all of the actions and see how they burn down. And they, and they have their own Kanban board. If you have a dedicated full-time scrum master for a team, that would be value that they could bring to the team. My approach is usually to stand up teams and then get, get going on other teams. So that's something I'll leave for that. Yeah, so if you were going to incorporate into this in the, into the Kanban board, would you allocate a, a number of story points to it so that you know, it's fitting within your budget for the sprint? Uh, maybe, but probably not because they would be too small. If, you, if you're doing that much improvement, it's not really Kaizen, it's quite radical. It's not little and often. Um, so I think maybe, I mean, if, if you wanted to do a half day workshop to learn about something, then that's quite sizable. So I'd say, hey, you know, let's just estimate it's probably a point or something. So to make sure that it doesn't influence the velocity, because if you're doing that, you're not doing other stuff. But you should assume that in every sprint, you'll spend some time even if it's a few hours, doing things to help yourself. And so this would just be, in the last sprint we had 40 points we finished, including the stuff we did with the retrospective. So in this sprint we can probably pull in 40 points and this stuff we've agreed to do as well. All right, thanks. Uh, there is a question through from Scott on Skype. Um, so some people do get carried away with what went wrong and complaints. Any favorite techniques for getting back to a more positive mindset? Yeah, um, smile laugh about it. And this is what the mood is about. We, we should find uh, fun in adversity. Um, but secondly, when people continually say, well, it just never works around here. We, we can't do Agile here. No one thinks like Agile. You know, it's just not going to work. That might be true. Not about ABS, but it might be true in general. And what I would say is fine, but what can you do differently next sprint? What can we do? Actually, I don't say you. I say, what can we do differently? And I just continually ask questions. How did that impact you? How do you feel? How would you do that differently next time? What, what was going through your mind at the time? So I, as a, it's a leadership technique and, and a, a mentoring technique to ask, what can we do about it? But you're right, I've seen, I've been in some retrospectives where it's a, maybe a dysfunctional team that's been together for a while and there's some quite uh, dark uh, mentalities in there, people feeling really down and another retrospective waste of my time I just want to get back to work and that means that they haven't seen the benefit of the retrospective these should be fun events they should be things people look forward to and people will generally when they start bonding together and spending time with each other enjoy each other's company this is one reason why it's really important to be co-located teams and another reason if it's really people are feeling threatened and feeling down that's the best time to say let's do the retrospective in the coffee shop nearby just press, hit the reset button. Um, but that is a real challenge quite often. Any other questions? Hi, Gareth. 
Hello. This one. Yep. Yep. Um, so retrospe retrospectives are quite powerful in terms of learning from from sprints and you know yep. improving as a team. Have you got any experience or suggestions how teams can share their retrospectives with other teams that might be at different levels of maturity, so yeah. that other teams can learn from others? Interesting story here. Uh, one of my earlier teams was about five years ago now. And I had one large team, and we agreed that it was too large, so we'd split it into two teams. And I was the scrum master for both teams, uh, and they sort of, what they did, did they do? They shared sprint planning and review, because we had the same product owner, and then they had their own retrospective. At the same time, I was coaching a few scrum masters, and, and I wanted them to see what I do. Um, best way is to actually go and see. And uh, one of them now, actually, is... Uh, one of the top consultants in Auckland, and I'm still in touch with him, but um, he sat down and the whole team sat down, and what we said is that the team themselves are around the table and they run the retrospective, and then other people can sit and observe. And this, is, this shows the power, by the way, of silent brainstorming, uh, because we had these uh, tickets, oh, loads came up, I put them on the wall, and somebody wrote, fishbowl. Fishbowl, who, who wrote this? Uh, it was Donnell, I remember. Yeah, it was a young, quiet graduate, you really never got a peep out of a really quiet lady. And she said, um, you know, I didn't know you were going to read them out. <laughs> um, I, I just feel a bit uncomfortable having this retrospective with everyone around. And I thought, of course, I'm sorry. Look, everyone else, I'm sorry, can you, can you leave? And so the team just had their thing. So in answer to your question, I would, uh, from that experience, would be very hesitant to bring other people in, unless it was a very mature team and they were happy to be fishbowled. But you, you want to feel safe enough that you can say anything. You, you should be able to say, you know what, I've had a really lazy week. I've got nothing done. I had a hangover on Monday. You want to be able to openly say that to the team, as long as it's not happening every time. You're less likely to do that to the broader organization, and we want honesty. So um, these, I would encourage the team to print these up to see the outcome. I think the best thing for teams to run good retrospectives is to have a coach, have a facilitator to professionally run it. Because all I, generally when I see people, when they try it themselves, they don't know what they don't know, and they generally just go, hey, here's a few post-it notes, tell me what the problem is. Uh, okay, well, there's a lot of problems, what do we do about it? They, they don't have that structure because they've not seen it. You need to know it to see it. So. Uh, it's not a sales pitch, right? You, you, having an agile coach there to guide the team, and then once the team have done it themselves for a while, or had an agile coach coach them for a while, I'd sometimes circulate people around and say, hey, over to you, you're going to facilitate yourselves today, so they can learn, and then maybe they can facilitate other groups. Does that help? Yeah. Any more questions? So, um, sorry, I missed the, the beginning, so you may have covered this. Um, so, in your retrospective, you keep talking about your teams. Yeah. In the ABS, um, typically our teams are made up of our core team and then an extended team, which would include um, some IT people like your BAs and your architect, etc. Yeah. Do you see them inclusive when you talk about teams as well as the product owner being involved in the retrospectives? Um, the product owner is definitely invited. Having said that, I've had occasion when the team wanted to talk about the product owner. And so I would say to the PO, look, the team wants to just get through a few issues um, and don't want you there. I'm sorry about this. We'll, we'll tell you what went on. Um, that's quite a difficult conversation um, because sometimes the product owner can be quite controlling. So that happened to me once. Um, it would be on a case-by-case -case basis. Generally, the core team is what I view as the people doing the work and it would be a size of six plus or minus three and would include the BAs, the testers, the developers, any, anyone doing the documentation. If you had um, a project manager, you may, I may well have the PM come along too, depending if it's the right person in the right context. If the team has lots of other people like a test manager and a UX specialist and an architect who may be involved in interacting with the team, I wouldn't invite them along. It's got to be the tight six people in the team because they're the people, they're that, that circle that I create of safety around that team is the six people. 
and the people outside of that is how they interact. Now it could be, and it's happened quite a few times, that we have a, a, a middleware developer or an architect who the team are struggling to get hold of. Then it would be either up to the team or up to me as a scrum master to have that conversation with people saying, we've just had a retrospective, um, this challenge emerged, um, this is how the team feel and it's how it's impacting them, and I'd give them redirected feedback. So that's part of the role of the scrum master then to ensure you're coaching people who are touching the team. So would it be fair to say though that as a rule of thumb when you're planning for your retrospective that really um, the first principle is involve everyone that was in the sprint? That's right. Yeah. People okay. doing the work. Yeah. And if people are not turn, turning up that's a problem. Um, but I usually use my personality to ensure people come along <laughs> and bring cake. But people should, if, if people want to be part of the scrum team, they need to be part of the retrospective. That is, is an expectation. And so in our chartering session, that would be, if it was a problem, we would bring it up. And maybe I'd ask the team to say, well, why is John not here? Bring him along. I, yesterday I talked about John, um, the, the dysfunctional team member. And there was a, a guy. There's a guy called John, and he said, I don't have time for all of these meetings. Uh, you can either have me at the review or the retro. So and it became a dysfunctional challenge for the team. Uh, but we deal with it, right? We, we have adversity and you deal with it. Okay, just one other question. Um, yeah, co-location is the, the, the best way to be. Yeah, we hear that. Um, yeah. We're not co-located. So no. which of the... Uh, retrospective techniques and practices, uh, the activities um, can work quite well over uh, you know, a more virtual arrangement. So there was a case a few months ago where there's one person working from home and he Skyped in. And what we did, uh, we, the moodometer, um, everyone else did their mood and then the guy online I, he gave me a pen and I stood on the whiteboard and said, tell me to go up and down like that. It was a bit of fun. Um, so we could do that. I mean, it would be quite hard with too many people doing that. If it was, uh, there's another two teams uh, in Auckland and Wellington. I made a point of splitting them up and having uh, separate retrospectives. If you definitely need to have one team together, the silent brainstorming can work. And what I would do is we would capture the post-it notes in one place. I tend to bias to the people I'm with. It's just the way humans work. And then I would say somebody down in, in Wellington or the other office, uh, can you just call out the post-it notes you've got and I'd quickly write them up and group them together. And if we can VC, great. Um, I mean, somebody can even FaceTime it on their iPhone. And if we want people to give input, maybe we've got one person on the keyboard Skyping in. That's me making the best of a, a, a bad situation. I, I really bleat and moan about it because it's really hard to facilitate a really effective retrospective if not everyone is in the same room. So, so where you do have sort of remote participants and if you are doing activities that are uh, working on post-it notes, um, would it be useful to have um, basic, maybe a, a proxy or a scribe in that room to represent the, the people who've, who are contributing their ideas yeah. online rather than obviously having somebody in the room who's coming up with the suggestions, contributing and uh, coming yeah. up with suggestions and also trying to represent the the, the remote parties as well. Yeah, uh, and that's what I did with that Auckland Wellington team. Is I had a there was a, a, a junior scrum master who was my my wingman, and she she was in Auckland while I was in Wellington, and she was like being my eyes and ears and hands up there. You, you do you do the best with what you've got, right? There's no point just moaning about it, but it would be incumbent upon me to say we need to be together. Um, I don't know if you've heard this, uh, anyone. Um, I was working with some of the Spotify guys and somebody asked what's the best collaboration tool for distributed teams and he said that's, that's easy, it's a Boeing 737. I know they're expensive, right? But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, that's all I've got. Was that useful? Feedback? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. So for everybody who's not here, and I know there's quite a few people who like to sit at their desks and watch this. Um, we're doing another one tomorrow. Feel free to come down. It's so much more fun being here, just to labour the point about co-location. And finally, on Friday, if we can get nibs, I'd like to do the 
the lean principle session with the coin game. And it would be really good if lots of your team, the, you know, the management executives can come along to understand some of the rationale behind lean principles which predates Agile, which comes from Toyota. And it's a great game, flipping coins. I've got a big bag of coins here. So if we can arrange that, that would be fantastic. Thank you.